He saved the world and was sentenced to death right after he saved it. In September of 1939, Germany began their crusade to take over the world, country by country. As they conquered each country, everyone in those countries were put to work to help them take over the next country on their list. But believe it or not, no war in the history of mankind has been won with armies and soldiers. Most wars are won far behind the battlefield because most wars are really a war of information. Get the right information of where your enemy will be and you can send out your troops to destroy them. If you learn where your enemy will be attacking next, you can be there to intercept them. Learn what weapons they have and you can build better weapons to overcome your enemy's best hardware. Do this enough and you can win the entire war. But during World War II, it wasn't as simple as one country versus another. There were many different sides of the war, including Japan, Germany, and the Allied forces. Both Japan and Germany were trying to take over as much territory as possible in the shortest amount of time. But somehow, Germany was the biggest of them all, even though they had far less men and firepower. The truth behind their success was something called the Enigma machine. Essentially, it was a tabletop machine where you could type in whatever you wanted to say and it gave you a code. That code was then sent to the German soldiers fighting on the battlefront and put through another Enigma machine on the other end. This code would then be translated by the machine back into real German text and allow generals to get highly classified messages over enemy airwaves. No one hearing these codes would know what they truly meant because they didn't have a machine to interpret them and translate them back to German. But even if you did have one of these fancy machines, the parts inside of this machine allowed the Germans to choose one of 159 million, million, million possible settings. And even if you did know which one of those 159 million, million, million settings the Germans were using, the Germans changed which settings they were using every single day at midnight to a different combinations of settings. The Enigma code, as it's now referred to as, was the single greatest code machine in the world at the time. But sadly, it was invented and used by the Germans, who were killing millions of people and taking over countries left and right. Like I said in the beginning, wars are not won with soldiers, but rather with information. And sadly, it was the Germans at the start of the war that had the best information. By the way, if you made it this far in the episode, then type this into the comments down below and we'll show you what it means when translated through the Enigma code later in today's episode. Now, you might be aware that after Germany invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939, Great Britain and France declared war on Germany two days later because quite frankly, they knew their countries were next to be invaded. But one year earlier in September of 1938, the Great Britain Royal Forces started a small team of six of the most brilliant minds in the country in an effort to break the Enigma Code. These six people were tasked with breaking the single greatest code in human history up to that point, with 159 million, million, million possible combinations every day. And every single day they failed to break it, they knew soldiers on the front lines were dying as a result. One of those men was Alan Turing. While the other five men tried every day to break the code with their minds, Alan went off building a machine. And every day at midnight, the team of five of the smartest people in all of England were never able to break even one letter of the code. But Alan Turing insisted on building his machine. In his opinion, human minds could never break a code made by a machine, since machines can do things faster than the human mind. Allen believed that in order to break a code made by a machine, you just need a better machine. Allen's superiors ridiculed him and even tried to shut down his work building the machine. But he wrote to Winston Churchill, who was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom at the time, and told Winston Churchill his great plan to build a better machine. 
That's when the Prime Minister finally funded Alan Turing's work in building the Better Machine. In just two years, Alan built that Better Machine, which intercepted a single German message every single day at midnight, giving the daily weather reports to German troops. Because the machine was only looking at three words rather than every single word in the German language, Alan Turing's machine was able to decode the message and figure out which settings the Germans were using that day in just 13 minutes. By the way, those words were weather and Heil Hitler. Quite literally, Alan Turing built a machine to decode the greatest code ever built in just 13 minutes and his machine could do it every single day at a cost of just $7 per day. Once they had the code for that day, Allied forces, including the United Kingdom, United States, and the Soviet Union, could run every German message through this code to determine where the Germans were going to hit next and effectively stop them at every turn. By 1942, Alan Turing's team of six people working on the Enigma code machine were decoding over 84,000 messages per month, which translates to over two messages every minute, day in and day out. But that's a lot of information coming in, and if the Allied forces acted upon all 84,000 of those messages, the Germans would surely figure out the Allies broke the Enigma code and they would stop using it as a result. So it was Alan Turing who came up with a mathematical equation to determine how much of that info they could act on without alerting the Germans to the fact that they broke the Enigma code. In fact, on the day they broke the Enigma code, one of the six people on their code-breaking team had a brother fighting as a soldier on the battlefield. The Enigma code told them that his brother was in the next squadron of soldiers to be attacked by the Germans, but Alan Turing's team had to withhold the information and let the attack happen for fear of the Germans figuring out they broke the Enigma code too soon. His brother later died as a result of this attack. But as I said, it was Alan Turing who came up with a mathematical equation to determine how much information to use and how much to let go. His equation literally figured out that if you were to use too little information decoded from the Enigma machine, that the Allied forces would lose the war entirely. Use too much information and the Germans would figure out you broke the Enigma code, they would start using another coding machine instead, and you would have to start all over again decoding the new machine. Alan Turing wasn't done here though. During the war, he was responsible for decoding the entire operating procedure of the German Navy. He developed a statistical procedure which allowed allies to make more efficient use of their bombing planes. He also developed a procedure to work out the cam settings of the Lorenz Cipher machine. And finally, Alan Turing developed a portable voice scrambler which allowed allied forces to speak to one another on a secure phone line. According to experts in the field and accredited historians, Alan Turing was responsible for shortening World War II by more than two years and was responsible for saving over 14 million lives. In 1946, the year after the war ended, Turing was appointed an officer of the Order of the British Empire and elected as a fellow of the Royal Society in 1951. At this point in the story, you might assume Alan Turing would be a wartime hero, but virtually no one at the time even knew he existed. In fact, after the war, MI6 and the British Royal Forces burned all of his work and covered over the fact that his team even worked for the war effort at all. But as a man who loved solving puzzles, Alan ensured there was one key to the puzzle left standing. The machine, which eventually cracked the Enigma code and saved over 14 million lives, was a machine Alan Turing named Christopher. This name meant nothing to those around him until you started researching his early childhood. At the age of 13, Alan went to a boarding school named Sherborne where he didn't make any friends with classmates or teachers. In school, he met a boy named Christopher Morecambe, and the two boys quickly fell in love with breaking cryptography and solving math problems for fun. 
In fact, Alan's mathematics teacher once poked fun at Alan and Christopher for passing notes in class, notes which had cryptography on them, which no one could understand besides Alan and Christopher. But Alan told the teacher that his class wasn't challenging enough, so they had to create more challenging equations to solve in order to pass the time. Alan and Christopher would pass cryptography notes back and forth in every class. And finally, Alan chose to write a message in cryptography to Christopher, telling him how much he loved him. But that was the day Christopher never showed up to school. Christopher passed away from complications of bovine tuberculosis at the age of 19 years old. Years after Christopher's death, Alan named his famous machine after Christopher to honor his legacy, the legacy of his first true love. That machine named after Christopher would later become the home computer and has led to the invention of the smartphone and every other computing device in human history. So whatever device you're watching this episode on right now is only capable because of the work of Alan Turing and his invention of Christopher, named in honor of his first true love. In 1952, just seven years after the war ended, Alan began a relationship with Arnold Murray. They met outside of a royal cinema in Manchester, England, where Alan invited Arnold to lunch. Not even a month later, Alan's home was broken into, but the criminals never stole anything. During the investigation, Alan Turing told the officers the reason they found Alan and Arnold together in the same home was because they were in a relationship. At the time in England, it was a criminal action to be gay. Therefore, both Alan and Arnold were charged with, quote, gross indecency. The case of Regina versus Turing and Murray was brought to trial, where Alan pleaded guilty to being in love with Arnold and never denied the action of being with another man. Turing was then convicted and given the choice between prison or chemical castration, meaning he would have to take medication for the next two years in order to get rid of his sexual desires altogether. Not wanting to give up his work in building machines or breaking codes, Alan Turing chose chemical castration. This medicine was so damaging to Alan's body that it made him uncontrollably shake and lose his entire will to work on anything. It essentially removed his entire will to live. Worse yet, because he was now convicted of homosexuality, the British forces removed his security clearances and barred him from working on any future projects to help in any future wars. He was even denied entry to the United States, even though, again, he saved the United States and countless US soldiers' lives. It is speculated that the entire thing was set up by MI6 to stop Alan Turing from continuing his work or from Alan taking credit for his work saving the world. After all, the criminal who broke into Alan's home that night never stole anything and has yet to be caught. In fact, after Alan and his partner Arnold were arrested for homosexual actions, the police in England stopped the investigation into who broke into Alan's home. But what is known for sure is that after about a year under the chemical castration drugs, Alan Turing committed suicide on June 7, 1954. He was just 41 years old, and the investigation into his death determined he bit into an apple filled with cyanide. This was speculated as a recreation of Alan Turing's favorite movie from Walt Disney, called Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which Alan continually said was his favorite film. Two biographers who later wrote about Alan Turing said he took, quote, an especially keen pleasure in the scene where the wicked queen immerses her apple in the poisonous brew. It took the British government 50 more years to even admit Alan Turing worked in the war effort at all and acknowledged his achievements. But it wasn't until 2009, more than 55 years after he died, that a British programmer named John Graham Cumming started a petition urging the British government to apologize for Alan's prosecution as a homosexual. After 30,000 people signed it, the Prime Minister named Gordon Brown, 
released a statement saying the treatment of Alan Turing was, quote, appalling. Two years later, in December of 2011, members of the British Parliament requested the British government pardon Turing. Finally, in 2014, the bill was adopted, and Queen Elizabeth II signed a pardon for Turing's conviction of gross indecency. Between 1885 and 1967, 49,000 men were convicted of gross indecency under British law for being homosexual. And finally, in September of 2016, the British government announced their intention to expand this pardon to other men convicted of similar offenses in what is now called the Alan Turing Law. In 1994, Manchester, England, renamed a stretch of roadway to be called the Alan Turing Way, and a bridge carrying this roadway was renamed the Alan Turing Bridge. A statue was later set up in June 2001 in Sackville Park. The statue depicts Alan Turing sitting on a park bench, holding an apple, the very thing Alan used to commit suicide after the government forced chemical castration on him. It is known as an incredibly grim memorial to his legacy. The bench Alan sits on has text carved into it, reading, quote, Alan Matheson Turing, 1912-1954. And this text, which when translated through the Enigma Code, says, Founder of Computer Science. In 1999, Time Magazine named Turing one of the 100 most important people of the 20th century, stating that, quote, the fact remains that everyone who taps at a keyboard, opening a spreadsheet or a word processing program, is working on an incarnation of a Turing machine. In 2008, the University of Manchester renamed one of their buildings to be called the Alan Turing Building, and in June of 2012, a blue plaque was unveiled at King's College to honor Alan. Later, in March of 2021, the Bank of England revealed that Alan Turing would be portrayed on the new 50-pound note and officially put Alan's portrait into circulation beginning on June 23rd, Alan Turing's birthday. Annually, a science award is given in Alan Turing's name, and a 2019 BBC series, as voted by the audience, named Alan Turing the greatest person of the 20th century. But how do you properly thank a man who single-handedly saved over 14 million people and decrypted the messages to end a world war. In his life, the answer the British government had was to convict him of loving someone of the same gender. In those days, even if you saved the world, homophobic people were so hateful that they still would not allow you to be gay. So if you live in the United States, United Kingdom, France, Germany, or any other country, you have a gay man named Alan Turing to thank for your freedoms. And I find it kind of ironic that a gay man was the one to stop the Nazis from invading countries and stop the Nazis from winning this war. Because the Nazis and the Allied forces both discriminated heavily against gay people. To honor a man with such accomplishments, it is not fair to posthumously offer a pardon on something which should have never been a crime in the first place. In fact, the only way we found to honor Alan Turing is by telling people how amazing he was and how he literally saved the world. But for a man who loved puzzles, we decided to give him one. Because in the beginning of our episode today, we even gave you a coded message of our own. When translated through the Enigma code, it simply reads, Thank you, Alan Turing. Anyway, if you want to learn more about the LGBTQ community, check out this episode right here, or subscribe for weekly episodes. And if you like what we do and want some awesome merch, go to pbrmerchstore.com. As always, I am your host, Professor Pride. Have a gay day, everyone, and bye for now.